So let's go into some actual concrete details about posing your subject in front of the camera. Now, initially, the idea of posing your subject can seem really strict and seem very formal, as if you know, there's only a certain way you should stand or sit or hold your head in a portrait. But that's not actually what it's about. What it's about is making your subject look good and feel comfortable. And there's no escaping the basic physics of how the human body sits, stands, moves, and what looks good on camera and what doesn't look good on camera, and also what makes people feel comfortable and what makes people feel uncomfortable. And ultimately, if people are comfortable in front of the camera, and if they're looking good, then that's all to the good, isn't it? That's what we're looking for. And if that means learning a few basic rules about how best to hold yourself, how best to stand or sit or move, then probably worth learning those rules, okay? Now, the first step to studying posing and how the body looks on camera is just to look at the body as much as possible in all sorts of different situations. Look at people standing, people sitting, people lying down, people as they move. And of course, you don't actually have to have a camera to your eye and be on a shoot to be doing this. You can look at existing photographs and find poses that you think work. You can look at people in real life, although be very careful about staring at strangers, don't get into any fights. And of course, you can simply look at yourself in the mirror. Um, there's no harm at all. And in fact, a lot of benefits to be had from getting a full length mirror and simply standing and moving and altering positions and seeing how your body position changes and how much, how different you can make yourself look just from a few little shifts of position. One important thing to bear in mind when you're looking at existing photographs there or the work of other photographers or other artists is that a pose that works for a certain person may not work for everybody. Uh, for example, if you find something that looks fantastic, it's a fashion shot, let's say, and it's probably a, a very demure, very delicate little model, and you try that same pose on the average person, it may well not look the same, because the average person is probably going to be quite a bit heavier and bigger than that demure little person. It's also possible that demure model may be more flexible, may be significantly taller. Different body shapes will react different ways. So. One thing you'll need to learn is you cannot necessarily carbon copy what you see in a magazine to something that you photograph with just somebody off the street or a friend of yours, okay? You'll need to learn that these poses have to be adapted a little bit and what works for one person might not necessarily work for the next person. Whilst I'm sitting here on this nice comfy sofa, it's a good chance to talk about the general principle of making your subject comfortable. Now, this is almost a, a golden rule, really, of portraiture. If you want to get the best out of your subject, you want them generally to be comfortable. The only real exception to this is if the very nature of the picture you're taking means they're gonna to have to be uncomfortable. So along the lines of those very staged, elaborate portraits I talked about earlier, where there's a big performance or a dramatic movement or some action where essentially somebody's got to be pushing themselves, working quite hard. Obviously in that instance, they won't be terribly comfortable. But pretty much the rest of the time, your best bet is to make sure your subject feels comfortable. You'll get much more out of them that way rather than having them on edge and tense. Most people don't relax when you point a camera at them. I suspect we've all experienced this many, many times and it's quite likely that applies to you as well. Uh, I'm okay in front of a camera personally, but it's not my job to be in front of a camera, so it's not really a big concern. However, we can take the comfortable thing slightly too far. I've got to be very, very careful with the comfort level because watch what happens if I make myself really comfortable in this sofa. Sit right back, make myself nice and comfy, and watch what happens to my body. I've instantly got a double chin. My arms have probably got fatter. Now, I don't have very big arms, so it's not the end of the world, but if I did have big arms, it probably wouldn't be the greatest thing going. And although I'm very comfortable, I perhaps don't look so good on camera. So you do need to be aware of how somebody is sitting, how it makes them look, even if inherently they're actually more comfortable. You know, comfort is a golden rule, but ultimately what's even more important is how good they look on camera. So don't just let people slump into a corner somewhere because it may not be terribly flattering to them. This is probably not a very good look for me, I should imagine. Now likewise, look how different I look when I don't slump and I sit forward. Or if I deliberately sit upright and I allow my spine to lengthen out rather than slumping over. It makes a massive difference to how I appear on camera. 
The best direction I ever found related to this is to try and get people to imagine that there is a, a strong invisible thread that is pulling and running through their head, down their neck and down their spine, and it's just lifting them up and pulling them up a little bit, just holding them erect. Because most people will not sit like this for very long at all. They will naturally start to round out and slump. That can work in some shots, but sooner or later, people's shoulders shrugging up, people's, you know, people's bellies will get larger. Whereas if they sit taller, they'll generally look, look much stronger, they'll look much better on camera. And you'll also have much more control over them because they're in a more, you know, a more stable position rather than just slumped over and not liable to move. So imagine the invisible thread lifting people up and you'll get a much better body shape out of people. Sticking with comfort, watch your subject closely for signs of tension in their hands and around their neck and their jaw. When somebody gets very, very tense, you may see almost white knuckles as they're clenching their hands together. And you can certainly tell if they're clenching and, and they're building up tension in their hands. You may see tendons in their neck going very, very straight and, and tensing up and the whole neck getting very, very tight. Or you may see people's jaws getting clenched. You may even see people's cheeks getting tight as they hold a fake smile for far too long. When you see somebody getting tense, stop. Take a little break. Get them, you know, put the camera down, out of the way, get them to take a few deep breaths, get them to change their state, get them to you know, roll their shoulders, shake their arms, whatever needs be so that they, they change their body position because what will have happened is they will have got more and more tense, more and more curled up and tightened around themselves and if you keep shooting it will only get worse. The only way to get out of it is to stop shooting and just let them, let them release, okay? Take a few deep breaths, get them calmed down and then carry on, okay? You're probably not going to get great pictures out of somebody who is doing this. Okay, it's not a great look. Now, needless to say, if the picture or portrait you're trying to take involves somebody getting tense, uh, working very hard, so those sports or action portraits or staged portraits I was talking about earlier, if that is part of the, the shoot and the thing you're trying to create, bear that in mind. Obviously, you've, you've got, you know, the person's got to be working hard, they're perhaps going to be exerting themselves, but allow them regular breaks. You know, don't break them. <laughs> you know, the aim is not to be competing in something, but to create a great picture. And you don't want to, people to get fatigued and end up getting injured. You want people to feel comfortable with what they're doing, even if what they're doing involves them exerting themselves. So yeah, don't push things too far, even if you do actually have to generate a bit of tension in somebody or get them working at a certain level. Don't be afraid to give them regular breaks. You know, at the end of the day, like I say, you're just making pretty pictures, not competing in the Olympic Games for something. One last thing to think about regarding posing before I stand up and start doing things full length is thinking about what light your subject is in in regards to what pose they're in. Now, if you're lighting something with a very broad, very soft light, I mean, at the moment I'm in a fairly soft light, there isn't much contrast from side to side, it doesn't make too much difference to me whether I move, whether I sit back, sit forward, the lighting doesn't change very much. If instead I were to use a much more controlled, more contrasty lighting, then a tiny change in pose could have a massive effect on how the shot looks. So you may well have to bear posing in mind in conjunction with what lighting you're using. Now on this course, I don't go into too much detail about lighting because I have an entire separate course about lighting, which goes into much more depth. But essentially remember that if you've got a big soft lighting source you're working with, then you're fairly free in how you pose. But the more controlled and strict your lighting, the more restricted your posing will be as well. So putting those words into action, let's start with me sitting here nice and comfortable on this sofa. Now, obviously, uh, I'm leaning slightly forward. I've got my elbows on my knees. And what I've also done is I've brought my chin slightly out and very slightly down. What that's done is that has tightened the skin across my jawline. Now, I appreciate I have a little bit of stubble here, so it's perhaps not the easiest to see. But this movement, this very simple chin out and slightly down, very slightly angled, tightens that skin, emphasizes the jawline, and it's almost a universal thing to do when photographing people. Okay, just to give you an idea of what happens if you don't, watch how my jawline changes if I pull my neck back in and bring my chin down, and I sit with my head in a more natural position. I instantly start to get extra skin around here. I mean, I am now, 40 years old, so I do have a little bit of extra skin around here. Most people do, apart from the very, very youngest, fittest of people. So a very gentle move, chin slightly out, very slightly down, just helps to tighten around there. It's almost universal, that trick. 
Okay, and of course it doesn't just matter if I'm sitting down, standing up, if you're doing a tight in headshot of me. That's one of the first most useful things to learn that will make people look better no matter who you're photographing and in what way you're photographing them. Keeping our movements quite subtle and small, let's look at something very simple such as eye contact. Now, direct eye contact with the camera right down the lens like I'm doing now can have a few different meanings depending on what expression it's matched with. It can be quite confrontational. Now, I'm not the world's greatest actor or model, but I'm sure you appreciate that if I'm staring right down the barrel of the lens and I've got a very severe expression on, it's quite a confrontational feel to the image. By comparison, if I'm laughing and joking, there's a certain engagement that you'll get with the viewer because I'm directly in contact with the viewer and I'm happy and I'm enjoying myself and there's an instant rapport you build. So direct eye contact doesn't have to be scary and confrontational. It can be warm and friendly depending on what expression it's matched with. Sticking with eye contact, if I turn my head to one side slightly and I look back at the camera, there's more of a conspirational feel to things, as if I'm letting you in on something, as if I'm being a bit sly, there's kind of a secret I want to let you in on. If I drop my head down and I look up to the camera, again, there's almost a feeling that I'm kind of letting you in on something, but there's also a feeling of sort of supplication, as if I'm, I'm beneath the camera, I'm, I'm below the viewer and looking up at them. I've kind of I've lost any power I have over the camera because I'm below it and it's looking down on me. I've become smaller than the camera. The other way around, of course, if I put my head back and I look down at the camera and I make eye contact from higher up, I get more power than the viewer. You also end up looking up my nose, which isn't the nicest thing going, but it's a way to instantly give somebody power and dominance in a photo is to have them look up with their head and look down with their eyes and also shoot them from lower down. That instantly gives them much more, you know, much more dominance over the frame, makes them taller by comparison, and that looking down eye contact is very powerful. But also, yeah, you do see a little bit up the nose, which isn't too flattering. It doesn't suit everybody. Different location, different shirt, because we're now talking about posing full length. Now, most of the things we've already talked about still apply. The whole golden rule of your subject being comfortable is still just as important if they're standing. And there's still that magic trick of getting them to lean their chin slightly out and down just to emphasize their jawline. But there are a few other little bits and pieces you'll need to bear in mind if you're shooting somebody full length in terms of how their body looks and how to make them look good on camera. First off, it's really important to bear in mind that any full length pose is going to start from the feet. Now it's true that you know, your subject can twist and turn and rotate and sometimes that can look good and dynamic, but essentially they'll be much more comfortable and the pose will work better if the position their feet are in supports the rest of it and they're not having to twist and contort themselves into something uncomfortable. Feet of course are so fundamental and the tiniest changes in how you, you, you have your feet placed can make quite a big difference. For example, if I stand straight to you like this with my feet very close together and straight to you, I obviously look a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit stiff and odd, like I'm some sort of soldier on parade. Straight away, just having my feet slightly further apart makes me look that bit more comfortable. What can make a massive difference though is simply a tiny adjustment in my angle. Just like that, I haven't, I've moved very, very little. I've moved probably a few inches with one foot in front of the other, and I've also angled my body very, very slightly. That also keys into one of the biggest principles, which is that very, very few people look great shot perfectly square to camera, certainly when standing. Almost everybody will look better with a little bit of an angle. Now, you may find some people have a, a better side, that's worth just experimenting when you shoot and find which is which, but pretty much everybody looks better with a little bit of an angle on them rather than square on like this, unless you're trying to create an image where they're deliberately big and tall and imposing. Okay, for the most part, standing side on makes people look a little bit slimmer and it gives them a little bit, there's just a, an inherent movement in the body that makes them look a bit more dynamic rather than a static confrontational shot or worse, of course, a really, really stiff pose like this. So the tiniest movement in the feet can make a massive, massive difference. So a lot of the time, you may want to give your subject a bit of an angle to try and take a bit of weight off them, make them look a bit slimmer, give them a bit of sort of slightly dynamic movement. But it may be that you actually want to make your subject look bigger and more imposing. And of course, the way to do this is to get them to stand nice and wide, possibly hands on hips, possibly crossing arms, 
And also, as I mentioned earlier, you can simply shoot from much lower down so that they become bigger and imposing and they end up looking down to you. This can be quite useful for something like athletes or anybody where you're trying to give them a, an air of power and strength. Another simple trick that can help with the feet is having your feet at different heights. Now this might be as simple as having you know, somebody with one foot on a step, or it might be that uh, it's actually part of what they're doing, you know, it's part of the, the, the action that you're, you're photographing them doing. It might be that actually all you need to do is simply have them with something on a different level, but not necessarily show that in shot. I mean, this is quite odd with me on my foot on the table, but it's changed my body shape quite a lot if you were to then crop the image to say about here. So you can use little things like posing blocks in a studio just to bring somebody's foot up and give them different shape to the body. You can use almost anything, if you like, to give one foot a different level to the other. You, you, know, you can use bricks, stones, you know, books that are lying around the studio, wherever you are, just to give yourself a bit of a different height to the foot that then obviously changes the body shape as well. Uh, don't make them stand on one leg though, they'll get very uncomfortable very, very quickly. Now you can take the little bit of shape and sort of dynamic movement from having a little bit of angle to the foot a little bit further just by adding in a slight step. Just simply get your subject to almost rock onto the back foot, forward foot, back foot and so on and catch them just, just as they move. It just creates that little bit of shape and sort of natural movement in a body that just makes a shot feel that bit more relaxed than of course the ultimate opposite which is standing very very stiff to camera. Yes it can feel a little bit forced but it also helps because it gives your subject something to do. Uh, as we discussed quite a lot if you get somebody stuck in place and they get very very tense it won't look great on camera but if you give them just a little bit of movement and you know pretty much anybody can simply you know rock back from one forward one foot to the other it'll help them relax and calm down and that as we know is a good thing. One thing that we can look at now with shooting full length, which I touched on briefly earlier, is what happens to soft body parts. Uh, we've already seen what happens if I sit right back and drop my chin down, I'll get a double chin. But other parts of the body can be soft and can change shape depending on where they are. Now I'm obviously fairly skinny, so I don't have lots and lots of uh, spare body to play with, but if I press my arms against myself in some way, my arms will flatten out. So that might not be the look I'm after. I might want to slim my arms down, in which case I would hold them away from my body, I would give myself a bit of an angle. But if I wanted to make them bigger, I could of course cross my arms. And that would, you know, particularly if I tucked my hand underneath here, I would actually be giving myself more bulk here. And of course for blokes who want to look muscly, that might be quite the look you're after. It may not, of course, suit women who perhaps don't want to have big arms. Okay, so bear in mind that any body part that presses against another body part is going to flatten out and in doing so look bigger. Now of course the same goes for legs. Now again I don't have great big legs so I can't really show you but you know if I, if I were to stand with them pressed together this would probably flatten out. If I sat down on something hard my legs would flatten out against the hard surface but if I wanted to slim them all I would need to do would simply stand with one leg behind the other or give it a little bit of angle and suddenly I've slimmed my body down quite a bit and I can of course you know, slim my arms down by having them away from my body just simple little movements like that can be much more flattering than somebody standing with everything together like this and all the soft parts of their body pressed up against each other and getting bigger. Now a prop of some sort can make or break your shot. Uh, it may well be it's also essential to the shot. It may be that the prop of whatever sort is an essential part of the story you're telling about the person so you've got to get it in the shot somehow. If that's the case then the golden rule to remember is that of course the shot is about the person not the prop so don't let the prop take over. It's also vitally important that the person is comfortable with the prop and knows what they're doing with it. That it doesn't become just something that they're really wary of and oh my god what am I doing with this I don't know what I'm doing and they become stiff and tense and uncomfortable and we know that's bad. Now of course if it's the case that the prop you're using is part of their work, part of what they do, you probably won't have this problem. You know, for example, I am holding a camera, I can look very comfortable with this, I can operate it in a way that looks like, you know, I know what I'm doing, but the same camera in somebody else's hands, because this is quite big and heavy and expensive, could not only make them tense because they're worried about dropping it, but they could be using it in a way that would make them look like, oh, I don't really know what I'm doing with this, and it would actually take away from the photograph, okay? So props can be great, they can make people feel more comfortable, 
They may be essential to your narrative, but beware of just throwing them in for the sake of it and beware of people using props which they don't feel comfortable with, they don't understand, and they essentially just use them as sort of a, a source of tension rather than, yep, okay, you want me working on my camera? Okay, I'll just, yeah, I have it to my eye. Is that all right? You can still see me. Yep, and it feels natural and part of the shot. Pockets and straps and things that you can hold your hands on or put your hands in are just the same as props, really. They can make you look more natural and more comfortable, or they can make things look contrived and forced and really very, very wrong. It all depends on you know, where the pockets are, how deep they are, what you want your subject to be doing as to whether it works or not. Now, for example, I've got you know, fairly deep, comfortable pockets in these shorts, so I can stand with my hands in and I can look like I'm casual and relaxed. Although there's always the risk that, of course, it cuts my hands off, which can look strange. If you're photographing women and they've got trousers on, their pockets are likely to be very, very tiny because they're not actually for putting your hands in. So trying to force the hands in won't work at all. By the same token, if you have something like a rucksack or a bag and you're, you've got thumbs in the straps, that can work, that can look natural. It can also sometimes look very, very forced. Also be aware of how holding your hands in certain places on straps or in pockets will change your body angle. You know, it can be that hands in pockets, if you lean back a little bit, bit of an angle can make you look nice and relaxed. Hands in pockets can just as easily force somebody to hunch over. And of course, it creates shapes in clothing. You know, I've obviously now got strange bulges on my thighs that we know are my hands, but framed a different way or shot from a different angle could easily look very, very suspicious indeed. And of course, the tighter and smaller the pocket, the more that might occur. Likewise, beware of bulges in people's pockets. Uh, you know, I've got a radio microphone in my back pocket, but if it was in the front, you might see a strange, mysterious bulge down there. So be aware of things like phones and keys and wallets on people, because it's not very complimentary if you've got a great big lump just here. Don't be afraid to use them. Don't be afraid to get somebody to sort of put their hands in their pockets or wherever it might be to make them feel more comfortable, but do watch closely. Make sure you're not just cutting people's hands off or you know, really changing their body shape, making them very uncomfortable. Okay, just like props, use them to augment the photo, but beware there's a few little catches that can make them look, yeah, not as comfy as you might think. Now finally, with regards to posing, I want to talk a little bit about working with people who are experienced in front of the camera. So professional models, actors, celebrities, people of that ilk who are very well trained in front of the camera and almost go into autopilot the minute you point a camera at them. Now in many ways, this can be very, very handy, particularly if you're just starting out with portraiture. If you've got somebody in front of the camera who's experienced and knows how to hold their body and look good, you can take your mind off that and you can concentrate on all the other aspects of the shoot you want to focus on. Um, I've certainly had no end of very, very well-run, well-organized shoots whereby professional models have made my life several times easier because there's lots and lots of things to get done. I've got, say, lots and lots of catalog stuff to shoot, and a professional model just knows exactly how to stand and they move almost every single frame. You know, every time I, the flashes go off, they sort of shift from here to here. They're very natural about how they move. They look okay on camera and almost don't need to direct them, and that can be brilliant. Okay, so there's no harm at all in using professional models or people who are much more experienced, it can take a lot of pressure off you. The catch is, it can mean that, like I say, they often go into autopilot and all you get is these pre-packaged, this move, that move, move number seven, move number eight, okay, which might not be what you're after at all. Um, I've also had my fair share of celebrity portraits whereby the celebrity just goes into camera mode and all they give you is this face. They just they play out a role and that's what they do. And of course, if all I'm getting is just some publicity shot, well, fair enough. But if I'm trying to get something more interesting than just, this is my camera face, it's quite hard work. So sometimes having somebody who's so experienced can work against you and you may need to, you may need to struggle to kind of get them back to a point where they're a bit more relaxed and giving you something that isn't just the pre-packaged set of moves that they do. But quite a useful place to start if you're you know, inexperienced and you want to concentrate on the technical side of things, the lighting and all sorts of other bits and pieces. Having somebody who's comfortable in front of the camera is a big plus. I'd recommend it to start with. Posing is a really important skill in portraiture, and I've only really scratched the surface here. Knowing what looks good doesn't constrict you, it liberates you. The, the more comfortable your subject is, the better shots you're likely to get full stop. Now you can learn more about posing by looking at existing photographs, by looking at people, by making a prat of yourself in front of the mirror. Uh, essentially anything that helps you understand how the body moves and stands and sits is all good. 